Sustainability. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome to our Synod uh, the Reverend Canon Dr. Judy Paulson. Judy serves as the Professor of Evangelism and Director of the Institute of Evangelism at Wycliffe College in Toronto. Her passion is the sharing of the gospel in today's North American context. She holds a Master of Applied Science from McGill University, a Master of Divinity from Wycliffe College, and a Doctor of Ministry in Missional Leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary. Judy is an ordained Anglican priest, serving regularly at Grace Church on the Hill in the Diocese of Toronto, and Judy is a grandmother. Welcome, Judy. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bishop Mary. Um, it's a real joy to be with you all. Uh, it's a little strange for us to be meeting this way. Um, and I, I see some faces I already know, which is, uh, which is also great. I think eight or nine people in this diocese I have some connection to. And I've uh, just enjoyed watching the greetings go up from all of you from your different parishes. And it always gives us such a sense of the church spread out uh, around the world. So um, it's great to be with you and thanks so much. Um, so we'll just leap right in. Uh, perhaps I can open us with the, a quick word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious God, may you ever keep before us the call to be disciples making disciples. Uh, may it infiltrate every aspect of our, our ministry. May we keep before you the people that do not yet know you. Above all, we give thanks for our own knowledge of you and what you've done in your son, Jesus Christ. May all the honor and the glory go to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's leap right in. Um, at some points, I'm going to be asking you to give some feedback in the chat line, um, and then if we have time, I'm hoping also for some time for breakout, uh, at least one breakout group um, in which I would suggest we put people into maybe groups of six. Uh, but let's first see how much uh, we can get covered as we talk together about this issue of how do we invite people? How do we share the gospel in these times that we're in? So first of all, let me say a little bit uh, so that you know who this person is that is talking to you. There's me uh, and my husband about a million years ago uh, with our firstborn. And there's our firstborn and his two sisters uh, about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Uh, there's us with the grandkids that uh, Mary has mentioned. And uh, those of you that are grandparents, it's a joy uh, to be with them. And one of the heartaches of the pandemic is we haven't seen them. There's what I want to be doing with my grandkids this summer. And we're hopeful that here in Ontario, we're getting there with the vaccination. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, this is what I do. Um, I have sort of, I wear two hats, really. Um, oh, I see Tim Weeb in the waiting room, another person that I know. Uh, so it's great to have Tim with us today as well. I wear two hats. One, I teach evangelism um, at Wycliffe College. Principally, I work with MDiv and MTS uh, and Diploma in Lay Ministry people who are studying at Wycliffe. The other part of my job is to work with churches and uh, dioceses and different denominations to help them cultivate churches of disciples who are making disciples. That's really where we all need to go. And it's not just an Anglican um, hesitancy, shall we say. So... Uh, one of my great joys is I get to travel around and work with a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts, and I love it. So here's the question really we want to face today. How do we proclaim Christ to a world that seems disinterested? Well, the good news is 
this world is not as disinterested as we may think. Why do I say that? Well, let's first take a look at what I'm hoping that we'll learn today and carry over into tomorrow. First, I want to explore some research on two groups of people that form part of the Canadian population, the privately faithful and the spiritually uncertain. So we're gonna take a close look at some fairly recent data into those, uh, into those groups of people that are part of our population and society. And then I wanna consider an experiment for your church to try. Whether you're meeting in person or whether you're meeting online, um, it doesn't really matter. This is an experiment everybody can try, and we'll consider that. And thirdly, if we have time, um, if we don't have time, I'll just share my slides uh, to whoever at the diocesan synod office wants to have a look at them and disseminate them. But I do have some additional slides prepared to reflect on the images and assumptions and experiences and even our associations with evangelism that have led to the place where almost zero evangelism is happening in many of our churches. Um, so we'll just take a look at that. What are the reasons uh, that we got to this place uh, that we find ourselves in? But let's go back now to that first um, goal for this session. Who is this disinterested world that we hope to share the faith with? What are their spiritual questions and longings and beliefs? And maybe we also need to ask ourselves, why should we care about these people? Well, um, I hope that our pragmatic reason of saving the church, uh, putting people in our pews is not uh, the first thing on our mind. Nevertheless, we are in a state of decline in church attendance. That is beyond dispute. And so the rise of the privately faithful and the spiritually uncertain uh, for sure, it can be seen as a crisis, but I think it can also be seen as an opportunity. Uh, if we look at the challenges facing the early church, they might well have seen, you know, the, the, the landscape, if you like, as a dangerous one for the church. Uh, there were certainly pockets of persecution, uh, there was great uh, tumult. Uh, you know, there were there was a powerful empire in place. Um, there were all kinds of things going on that could have meant the church was basically fearful and fearful even to share the gospel. If we look at all that's going on in the early church, and yet what we actually see is the greatest period of growth in the life of the church. So we can look at the time that we're in and see the opportunity that exists. And I wanna to try to build a case to show you the opportunity that exists today. So what I mostly wanna talk about is uh, some data that came out uh, of an Angus Reid poll that was looking specifically at spirituality across the Canadian landscape. So they conducted a, a public interest poll um, in the early part of 2017. And then they analyzed this data and they published it April 13th, 2017. And you can basically just Google spectrum of spirituality in Canada uh, and up will come this Angus Reid uh, block of research data. It is a fascinating uh, bit of research to look at. And I would encourage you to do that. We're just going to be taking a, a small look at this data. So what did the poll do? They asked about three things. People's beliefs, 
their behaviors and attitudes. Questions that they asked about beliefs first. Well, they asked about the sort of things you would expect. They asked about whether people believed God existed or a higher power even was the way they worded it. They asked whether people believed in life after death and what sort of God, if God did exist, was God active in the world or was God sort of an absentee landlord? They asked about heaven and they asked about hell. So these were the key beliefs that they tapped into. But what else did they look at? They actually asked about behaviors. Which of these behaviors did people do once a month or more? They asked about prayer, attendance of religious services. And remember, they weren't just polling people of, about the Christian faith. They were polling people about faith in general, spirituality, if you like. They also asked about whether people talked about faith or religion with their family and then with friends. So expanding the circle out a little bit more. They asked about whether they read a sacred text regularly. And they asked about experiencing God's presence. So all quite interesting things. And we'll look at uh, how these different sort of segments of Canadian population responded to these questions in a minute. But first, let's look at what they asked about attitudes. So which of these words has a positive meaning for you. And then take a look at the words. Some of them are words that would be common to somebody that had a Christian memory of some sort. Uh, some are more sort of populist words, but they all have something to do with a spiritual belief, if you like, and understanding, and perhaps experience. So take a little look at this word, this uh, group of words. They're an interesting group of words for sure. And then they asked about questions, attitudes, if you like, about the importance of things like happiness, community, and family. So they asked about questions about whether religion had an overall positive impact. They asked, and now a more specific question about the influence and impact of Pope Francis. They asked whether people felt guilty for not being involved in a faith. They asked about whether people wished for a closer relationship with God. Then they asked a question about how comfortable people felt around people who were either religiously devout or people who criticized religion. They asked people to select the three most important uh, facets, if you like, um, of their, their spiritual uh, lives. So which of these things were at the top of importance for people in their everyday lives? And finally, they asked a more general question about how happy people were in their family and friends and community overall. So I hope you get a sense now. So remember, they asked about people's beliefs, their behaviors, their attitudes, both more specific in, in uh, sort of prioritizing positive attitudes towards a word list, and then answering more uh, direct questions about people's happiness and their uh, place of community and family. Basically, what Angus Reid found was that people basically fell into 
one of four broad categories, four mindsets, if you like, on religion or spirituality today. First, they found that 21% of those that they polled, they deemed religiously committed. Now, we're going to look at, at what defines somebody uh, as religiously committed in just a minute. But as you can imagine, these are people that are, are uh, more likely to be involved in attending worship and praying uh, and who have stated clearly that their faith is important to them. So 21% of the Canadian population are religiously committed, according to Angus Reid. Moving one step down from that are people that they described as privately faithful. And we're going to look uh, at, in much more detail at this group of people. Basically, these are people who have uh, ideas about God, but they have no connection to the church or any um, gathering community of faith. The next group down, they labeled as spiritually uncertain. And we'll, again, we're going to look at the differences between the privately faithful and the spiritually uncertain in a minute. And then 19% of the Canadian population were deemed non-believers. So these were people that described themselves as decided non-believers, intentional non-believers. So what were some of the sort of the big picture um, takeaways from this more general analysis? Well, the most devout were found in the prairies, maybe not a surprise to anybody that's lived on the prairies. The least devout were found in Quebec and BC. So before we go on, I just wanna give you, because you're in the Diocese of Montreal, uh, a few more specifics. So for instance, the lowest level of uh, people that were deemed to be faithful, um, religiously committed people, the rate in Quebec was 14%. So if you think about that, you know, it's, it's a sizable drop from the 19% average across Canada as a whole. So only 14% um, described themselves in, in ways that would fit them into that category of religiously committed. And we'll look at that, what made people fit into that category in a minute. Quebecers were most likely though, to be found in the two middle categories. So Quebecers were not overly uh, represented in the category of non-believers. They were much more likely to fit into those two middle categories of privately faithful or spiritually uncertain. Well, just looking at this very broad introduction to this research, uh, I wonder if maybe you might put into the chat one word that describes your gut reaction so far. Uh, does it make you hopeful, these categories? Does it make you fearful? What's your gut response? And I realized that I can't actually see the chat on my screen because, <laughs> so I'm gonna have Mary maybe take a look and see what she said, sees there. Okay, Judy, we see. Um... Oh gosh, lots and lots and lots of people have said, hopeful, excited, surprised, potential, hopeful, opportunity, hope, surprised, hopeful, op lots of hopefuls and opportunities, 
Maybe we are the problem, says one person. Predictable, says another. Not surprised. Challenging, not at all surprised. Useful, not surprised. A chance, not surprising in Quebec. Opportunity, challenged, encouraging, very encouraging. Room to grow, possibilities and direction forward. Surprised, hopeful, concern, opportunity, squandering. Okay, so awesome. Uh, I think we understand that this profile of, of, of uh, the spectrum of spirituality across Canada, uh, but I think also in Quebec itself, uh, tells us that there are amazing opportunities in this. Um, here's the crunch though, as whoever that was that said, maybe we are the problem, um, it will definitely require us to do some changing. Uh, there's the word we all hate, change, <laughs> at least the majority of us. There is, by the way, about 10% of human beings who love change. Um, and we need to sort of lean into those people in these times where uh, we actually do need to think about this a little bit more. The most devout, according to this research, tended to be older, female, from a visible minority, and those who received formal religious education, interestingly. So I don't know in your context, um, but I would have to say when I look across the Diocese of Toronto, this really fits. By the way, I, I can send these uh, slides off. I, I'm happy for people to have these and use them if they're helpful in their own parish context. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about implications and I'm excited that you're excited um, by these results. But the question is, what do we do now? Uh, what do we do about this opportunity? So first, let's take a look very briefly at the religiously committed. What sets them apart? Well, some of their beliefs. Uh, the importance of their children being part of a faith community. This was actually the most interesting piece to me. Even though these folks are not involved in a church or faith community of any sort, they actually want their children to learn about faith through some recognized authority. Now, this ought to tell us that there is not a single church anywhere in Canada that should not be focused on doing something about this thing. Helping children learn about what the Christian faith is about. We'll talk about how you can do that with people who are not actually coming to church. So the key thing that differentiated these, differentiated these folk were behaviors. Prayer, they pray more often. They experience God's presence. They talk a little bit about that. Uh, they do attend services. Although uh, the definition of regular attendance was, guess what? Once a month. Only 58% report reading their sacred text once a month or more. Now, this, in fact, does tell us we have work to do. How can people be deeply shaped by scripture if, in fact, they're not reading the text even once a month? Uh, can we do better in this area? I think so. Now, here were the least positive words for this group of religiously committed people. Mystical, karma, were at the top of the list, but then theology and evangelism. <laughs> so the religiously committed don't like the word evangelism. And they're also very suspicious of this word theology. That uh, bears some thinking. Here was a really interesting little stat to me. 
88% of the religiously committed wish they had a closer relationship with God. This also tells us we have work to do. We may be giving people information, but we may not be helping them actually experience God's presence in their lives. And I don't mean to say that that there's some kind of formula for doing that. Obviously, this is about the work of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I think we need to be asking ourselves, are we giving people opportunity to express these longings, for instance? Of highest importance to this group were family and honesty and volunteering. Interestingly enough, this group in Canadian society, the religiously committed, are far and away above the other groups in volunteering for any number of things in their community. That's something we should actually be pasting over the website of every church across Canada. Here's what we do in our community. It ought to be one of the first pages people get to on our websites. And interestingly enough, the religiously committed also express the highest levels of happiness across all areas of life. Now, if you've been an Anglican priest, uh, if you have been a lay leader that has worked with people in any sense of pastoral care, you know that church folk have problems just like everybody else. Life does not spare us from its great sorrows. But the question is, how does faith help people weather those storms? And I think it does. I think that's why this data shows up. So these are the religiously committed. Um, as you can imagine, the beliefs that distinguish this group are belief in God, a belief that God is active in the world, a belief in the uh, potential to have a living relationship, a, a close relationship with God. But let's move away from the religiously committed now. Let's go on to the spiritually uncertain. So this Judy, group, I'm, I'm just want to interrupt for a second and oh, say, sure. Thanks, um, when do you want to hear questions? As the chat is filling up with various comments, but <coughs> not all of them are like likely questions to you. But one of the so, questions is, yeah, what do, want, what do you want to love, do? What I'd love to do, you know, tomorrow we have a whole um, time set aside, the third time period in which we can um, raise questions because it's so hard in a in following questions in a chat you end up with many people asking the same question and you know questions can get lost i'm hoping too that out of the breakout time um we're hopefully going to have about 10 minutes to spend some time in a breakout session in this first session i'm hoping that you will also coalesce some questions that can be raised okay. tomorrow. you want me to coalesce them um, well, I think because we're probably my, by my estimation, we're going to have probably with 140 people here or thereabouts, uh, you know, if we put people in groups of six to discuss. That's oh, yeah, it's more complicated than that. Um, right now, the breakout groups are already organized for the workshops. So oh, okay. the best we can hope for is that at the beginning of each workshop, there's a chance for people to, of whatever size they end up at, um, there'd be okay. a chance. So, so in other words, breakout groups are off that. the table. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. I didn't realize that. I thought we could, in this session, go into uh, smaller breakout groups. Um, well, maybe maybe next year's Synod on Zoom when we're all so expert at it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's... Sorry. So this group, the spiritually uncertain. So remember, this is the next group up from the non-believers. These are the people who 
they have they have no connection to a church, that's for sure. Um, and they are not sure. Uh, they're not sure if God exists. Um, if they do think God exists, they mostly think he's not active in the world. But check out this number. Still, even in the spiritually uncertain, the majority of them believe that God exists. However, a majority don't believe in life after death, that God is active in the world, or in the existence of heaven or hell. But they express some uncertainty about, especially that last bit. Is there a heaven? Is there life after death? Check out this, the words that have the most positive meaning for them. What's at the top of the list? Forgiveness, morality, meditation, mercy, and then karma. I think karma is not necessarily understood in the fullness of how it's understood in the actual Eastern religions that teach it. Nevertheless, in our popular culture, there is a sense uh, that justice prevails in some sense. When people um, are nasty to others, somehow that nastiness comes back to bite them, for instance. But isn't it interesting that in this list of words that have the most positive meaning, forgiveness tops the list. Now, as Christians, we have something to say about forgiveness. How many times do we figure out a way to profile what the gospel teaches about forgiveness in such a way that people that aren't a part of our church might be able to engage in that conversation? I suspect that that second word that receives such a positive uh, response, morality, you know, most people in Canadian society do realize that ethics matters. So how do we engage them in the question of what forms people's moral frameworks? And the words that have the least positive meaning? Theology and evangelism. Yay, the topic of your synod, least positive response to this group. We'll talk in a few minutes about what that might mean for us. Okay, some more about the spiritually uncertain. They see religion's overall impact as negative. However, they see Pope Francis's impact as positive. Look at that, 72% feel Pope Francis has done good stuff. Now, if we think back four years ago when the poll was done, we can see that early in Francis's episcopacy, he was seen as somebody that uh, was humble, somebody that uh, eschewed, you know, he didn't want to live in the papal palace. He didn't want to wear the red shoes. Um, he was a bit of a, a, a counter-institutional guy. But Francis was also seen as somebody that had a heart for the poor. Do you remember he went and washed the feet of people in prisons, uh, in prostitutes, people that were deemed to be the undesirables of society. Uh, so we need to really attend to the fact that the spiritually uncertain are paying attention to what spiritual people do. But this group don't particularly wish for a closer relationship with God. They, after all, don't think that God is really active in the world. And they feel uncomfortable around devout people. Why might that be? Well, first of all, when we use all our language that they don't understand and they have never had any reason to understand it, 
they may feel like outsiders. Uh, when they feel that they are being judged for not having a church family, for instance. And, you know, we actually do do this to people. Uh, we're surprised uh, that they don't know the basic Christian story. Uh, but guess what? That can make people feel very uncomfortable, judged even. And they choose family life and a comfortable life as of high importance. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. In a largely consumer-driven, late capitalism society, a comfortable life is important to a lot of people. But the family life should be something that we really pay attention to. Okay, so these are the spiritually uncertain. Don't forget, this is the group that are next up from the ardent non-believer. But let's think about what this data tells us are the bridges to reach these people. Let's always be thinking about implications for ministry. All right, what about the privately faithful? The majority, as I said, want their kids to be formally welcomed into a religious community. This is weird, right? These people don't have a connection to a religious community. Why do they want this for their children? Uh, there was a really interesting article in the Globe and Mail recently. It was written from the perspective of a mother who has decided to start taking her child to church, even though she doesn't believe in God. So interesting. She saw the rhythm of life, the discipline, the possibility. She saw that because her parents hadn't taught her anything about faith, they had in a sense limited her experience as a human being. And she wanted her own son to have the possibility of experiencing something she didn't know. This ought to cause us to actually jump up and down with glee, this part of the data. A strong majority of this privately faithful group believe that God exists and that he is active in this world. They even believe in heaven and in life after death. A slim majority also believe in hell. A majority pray. But these people do not read any sacred text. And that ought to tell us that in this day and age, they likely don't know what Christians believe, really. They may have some vague idea, uh, but they don't know the heart of the Christian story. They don't attend services. They don't feel God's presence. And they don't talk about their faith. The most positive words for these people. There we are again. Forgiveness is at the top of the list. Morality is there. Mercy is there. Meditation is there. All of these things are things Christians have a lot to say about. How can we use what is already in the Christian tradition to engage with these people? And I kind of love that karma is also there. Uh, people want some justice in the world. And the least positive words. Yep, theology and evangelism. What else about the privately faithful? Well, they see religion's overall impact as negative. Do we ever ask people what their negative experiences have been? 
Um, a number of years ago, um, we brought our kids to Mont Saint Anne on a ski trip, and um, I always have to take a ski lesson when I ski. Otherwise, I will definitely kill myself on the hill. Um, so the ski instructor that I had, as it happened, nobody else signed up at that time slot. So it was me and one of my daughters and the ski instructor. So right off the bat, he says to me, so what do you do in Toronto? And I said, well, actually, I never tell anybody what I do until I've known them for at least half an hour. He was like, oh, okay then. So I'm not kidding you, right on the half hour, he pulls up at the bottom of the hill and he says, okay then, what do you do? And I said, I'm an Anglican priest. And he, he was just quiet for a minute and he said, why, why didn't you wanna tell me that? And I said, you know, a lot of people have had negative experiences with the church or they have negative assumptions associated with it. So I like people to know me for half an hour first. <laughs> he said, fair enough. And we ended up having a really great conversation about why I did the work I did, uh, what it was like to be leading the church today, what his ideas about faith were. It actually opened a door. Um, he also talked about some of his own experiences. and They were negative experiences in the Roman Catholic school system. So, you know, this, uh, we need to actually listen in this day and age to what people's negative experiences are. But check this out. Again, Pope Francis, 78% of these people have positive feelings about him. A slim majority sometimes feel guilty for not being involved in a faith. What is this about for people? Is there a longing at some level to be part of a faith community? This ought to interest us. And a significant majority of the privately faithful wish they had a closer relationship with God. So I ask you, on your website, anywhere on your website, is there something about helping people come to know who God is? Um, I think we ought to be asking these basic questions that some of these privately faithful people are asking about and longing for. And here we are again. Half of these people, or almost half of them, feel uncomfortable around people who are devout. Uh, they're uncomfortable around us. And they choose family life and a comfortable life as of high importance. Um, you know what I love? I love when churches run um, little sort of get your financial life in order uh, and everybody welcome uh, workshops. Um, things that aren't necessarily, um, you know, heavy on theology and presentation of the gospel, but things that might be perceived to be something that is helpful to someone's life. Um, I know that there's a lot of people in the business community today talking about the ethics of the business world? Do we engage in those conversations? What about family life? I love, uh, personally, I love the alpha courses on parenting. Um, churches that offer those and offer them particularly in a uh, less intimidating context, maybe a school, uh, maybe a community center, maybe even just homes, um, these can tap into some of these folks that are privately faithful and are quite nervous, if you like, about coming into a church building. 
So again, we always want to be thinking about implications, implications for this. So this is where I actually thought we might have the, the breakout group time. Um, but how about if we just um, give you a minute, actually, to think about what might be one implication for ministry on the ground out of what you've heard today? And Mary, what do you see coming up in the chat there? Oh, Judy, the chat has been very busy. So there's clearly uh, very stimulating. Uh, folks, do you want to stick in your uh, one thing? Um, so people have been responding as you've been speaking. Um, uh, implications. Yes to family workshops, lots of room for Zoom initiatives, writes Carla. Um, I'm finding this incredibly relevant to the presentation I'm giving in 17 minutes, says Grace. Spiritual direction, says Holly. Um, Wendy questions the percentages in any survey. Many people give expected answers and not just thought or just not thought out answers. I think we can have hope for all amounts of faithfulness. I also agree that the answers may be quite different in 2021. Um, George says we do have a lot of work to do on the ground. Implications revive program for getting closer to God for our members so they can share with outsiders. Um, Deborah questions the result on mysticism. Given interest in Buddhism, meditation, etc., I suspect that's actually a leading edge opportunity for evangelism. Uh, Stephen says, more intention towards ministry with children. Well, I think when we're doing ministry with children, we feel insecure sometimes because you can't fake it with kids. They know phonies. <laughs> um, finding those porous places for bringing in the people sitting just on the fringes. Spiritual direction, says Marilyn, is attracting seekers who are the unchurched. The numbers are tentatively supported, supportive of the thought that our outreach isn't just a hand reaching into a void, says Ann Miller. Um, Mark, ask people if they've been hurt by the church, non-defensively. Be ready to apologize and lament. Yeah, all, all good uh, responses. And, you know, I hope that what we do today, we, we really have so little time together that really you'll, you'll just have your imagination sparked. So there, here's one last one from Penny. We need a vocabulary for non-clergy people to engage with their families and others. Absolutely. Um, I think that is probably the most important point. Um, we're going to talk about that in a, in a minute. So I'll just say we are going to save these chats for you. Uh, somebody is collecting them and we'll get them to you at the end of your talk. So you'll have an idea of what we were saying. Um, there is no group. Uh, the group will not be as wide perhaps tomorrow because we'll have our business in it. But we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, carry on. Thank you, Judy. Okay. Um, now, Mary, I just want to make sure we have till 11, right? Uh, I'm, I'm in the other part of the order. Yes. Workshop number one. Well, 1045. We have a break um, at 1045. Yeah, we, we started a little bit later, but I, I, I think I think the bishop later. went on a bit long and then she, she was on a, a, a feedback loop anyway. OK, well, let me maybe conclude um, with some of the broad wait. implications. Wait, wait, Robert, what do you do you want to tell us about timing? He's not in the same room as me, so. All right. He's, uh, he's not able to answer. OK. Judy, just carry on for a few more minutes. Sure. Okay. So we're, uh, we're we're good. Uh, we're good till uh, uh, around ten forty-five. Which is now. Ten forty-five, which is now. Okay, yeah. I'm going to so show you. So, if you want to, if you want to conclude, if you want to conclude, yeah, if you, sure. if you want to conclude, uh, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, wrap up and then come can reconvene for uh, workshops. Great. Okay, I'm going to show you four more uh, bullets on this one slide, and that will 
uh, give you fodder for your workshop discussions. So here's the thing. We may think the world is quite disinterested, but that's not true according to this data. Canadians actually keep the faith to varying degrees, but relatively few reject it entirely. Remember, in Quebec, only 14% of the respondents to this Angus Reid data were deemed non-believers. The majority fell into those two groups of the spiritually uncertain and the privately faithful. They are actually far less hostile than attendance might imply. And this also maybe explains why many of our churches that have been moving to online worship during a pandemic have seen significant in increases. Now, it's, it's really hard to gauge what that means, but it at least means some of the people that weren't joining us before are listening in. The spiritually uncertain are somewhat interested in questions of the existence of God and life after death, and are generally uncertain about their beliefs. When in our society do people get to explore what they believe? We ought to be giving them opportunity to do that if we want to eventually get to the place where we share the gospel with them. The privately faithful, remember that's, you know, a very sick 30% of the Canadian population are deemed privately faithful, having no connection with the church they are actually very interested in questions of faith. They want their children to be formally welcomed into a faith community and they often pray. We ought to be asking ourselves, how can we connect with these folk? This is between 11 and 12 million people across Canada. Here are the most challenging group to, to connect with, younger male non-immigrant Canadians. There's a, a church north of Toronto that has decided to focus everything they do around this group. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it looks weird to me as an Anglican, but I love that people are asking these questions. And we need to recognize that very few people really like the words theology or evangelism. Okay, let's stop there. What are we gonna do when we come back? Um, we're going to look at what deep cultural change in the church is going to mean, because that's actually where we need to go. We're gonna look at some of the pain, some of the possibility, and we'll talk very briefly about the work avoidance tactics that we use. But we'll look in the next talk at how we can equip the church for change in a time of change. Um, I guess I wanna say um, the data that we talked about earlier really does set us up to think about the possibilities. Um, so let's move now to think about what this might mean in terms of changing some of what we do, not what's at our core, uh, but more the way we operate. Just going to see whether I can, is, are people seeing my uh, slides right now? Yes, I'm seeing what does deep cultural change in the church mean? Great. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things on this slide. One is that uh, it refers to both pain and possibility. These have been called the two parents of change. You will rarely get change in an organization unless there is some pain, some reason to change. Neither will you get change unless there is some possibility seen by people. Otherwise, they're just going to give up. Um, 
you know, let's just circle the wagons, shutter the doors. Unless they see both of these things, what is the pain? What is the possibility? Very unlikely that change is going to occur. The other thing I think we need to recognize is that whenever we talk about change, we need to talk about our natural predisposition as human beings to avoid the work of change. And so organizations are having to confront these very human factors that are called work avoidance tactics when it comes to change. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those. Um, and you know we could spend a whole day talking about the default stories that we keep going back to and the work avoidance tactics that we sort of fall back into. Uh, these are things that will not help us. But let's start with something a little bit more positive. How exactly can we equip the church for change in a time of tumultuous changes, which is where we're at right now? I think the first thing we need to recognize is that while most people will recognize that the church needs to change, um, they themselves don't want to change. <laughs> And this is a problem for any organization going through a tumultuous time. Um, all, you know, hospitals, school boards, uh, any kind of major law practice, uh, it doesn't really matter. Even the way businesses operate, if we think about Kodak and how it operated 20 years ago um, and the cataclysmic change that needed to happen everybody actually is facing a time of change right now and the church is no exception in some ways i actually think the church has weathered some of the cataclysmic change that our society has gone through better than we think it has but the reality is if we want to change the culture of the church to make it a deeply missional disciple making uh, body if we want evangelism to be a natural part of what we do, after all, we do get up and say we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. And that word apostolic actually means sent out with a message. That's what the word apostle means. So if we're going to get up and say that week after week after week, can we actually take it seriously? It is going to mean some changes, not just for the pastor or priest, not just for the wardens, not just for the bishop. It's going to require changes for all of us because the problem lies in all of us. Now, this is a quote from uh, one of the leadership gurus of our age, Ron Heifetz. He says, because the problem lies in the people, the solution lies in them too. The work of addressing an adaptive challenge, and let's face it, the church is actually facing a number of adaptive challenges. Things like clericalism. Oh, that's the pastor's job to preach the gospel. Uh, biblical illiteracy. illiteracy. What is our story anyway? How does, you know, how does all that stuff in the Old Testament connect to me? Uh, there are, are a number of other adaptive challenges we're facing. One is privatized faith. Uh, for many years, I think many Anglicans said, well, you know, I have a private faith. Uh, and that was kind of a way of saying, I just don't talk about it much. But it's, it doesn't mean it's not important to me. Well, that privatized faith needs to actually come out into the open now. Uh, we are not in an age anymore in which we just divide the pie of Christendom up and look for the Anglicans to join us. <laughs> Those days are gone. Um, I would say there are a couple of other adaptive challenges present in our churches. 
One, one is a sort of functional agnosticism. There are still people in our churches who are there um, out of habit. Now, habit is not a bad thing, but habit is a very poor substitute for love. Um, we know from this Agnes, uh, Angus Reed poll that even people that are faithfully committed people are longing for a deeper walk with God. And so this is something we actually have to face as an adaptive challenge for us. Anyway, those are the adaptive challenges that we are facing. They will not be addressed by even the most brilliant of preachers. They will not be addressed by adding guitars. They will not be addressed by single little things that we do to tweak how great we already do liturgy. They will only be addressed by all the people addressing them. So this is one of the things I feel most passionately about. And it's something we just keep hammering home about as we train new clergy. How do we get the church to face these adaptive challenges? And the one, of course, that we're talking about today is that of a church full of disciples making disciples. That's actually what Jesus gave us to do. Disciples making disciples. So how do we get there? Let's start by doing these three things. By the way, this first one, praying for the privately faithful and the spiritually uncertain. You might say, well, of course we pray for people to, you know, discover faith. Uh, and, you know, we might do that when we meet for a prayer meeting or maybe it gets worked into our mission committee, something like that. Here's the thing. I have never seen a case of church renewal and revival that didn't start with prayer. And again, as Anglicans, we might say, well, of course we pray. You know, we're steeped in prayer. We spend so much of our time on Sunday morning praying. But what I'm talking about is prayer that is focused on the mission of God. Prayer focused on the spiritually hungry people all around us and prayer that doesn't just show up once a year in this meeting or that meeting, but this sort of missionally driven prayer can actually begin to permeate the whole life of the church. Think about it for a minute. How often in the prayers of the people is there included a prayer specifically for people in the neighborhood who have no faith connection or people at our places of work or even in our families and in our neighborhoods who have spiritual questions, prayer that we might actually be able to help them address those spiritual questions. This sort of prayer can actually permeate the whole life of the church. And it can lead to churches trying some new experiments to share the faith with people in these two groups who, let's face it, we already have these people in our lives. And then actually trusting that Jesus still calls people to himself. In fact, Jesus is doing this all the time. There are people that still occasionally walk into churches and ask to be told the gospel. More often, though, we have to go to where people are. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we actually do that. But first, do we actually trust that Jesus is calling people to himself, to new life? You know, Jesus was this often enigmatic and quite audacious person in a lot of ways. 
you know, he stood up at one of the major feasts in the temple and he said something as audacious as this. Is anyone here thirsty? Come to me and drink. He talked about the living bread. The water that if you taste of it, you'll never be thirsty again. Uh, do we actually hold these things to be true about our Lord? And do we understand that he wants as many people as possible to come to know that, that living life that can only be found in him? So I would just say, if you want to really experience renewal and revival in your church, start by getting the people that love to pray, to pray every day that your church may be a vehicle by which God uses to reach new people. Ask those people to pray daily for that. Uh, if you have a prayer group that meets, give them this to pray for each week. Try to find a way to either write a beautiful prayer that can be included in the prayers of the people or have people, if you are, have more of an extemporaneous prayer on Sunday morning, have someone that has a passion to reach new people that can pray this way. Pray for the privately faithful. Those people that believe God exists and that he's active in the world and they pray to him pretty regularly, actually, but they have no faith community in which to go deeper, to learn, to be supported in all of the trials of life, and to be equipped to actually go out and share that faith with others. So I would say these three things are the things we start with as a church. What do we pray for? Do you remember that first slide about the people that are, are considered, uh, you know, the religiously committed people? That first slide said that they, a really significant percentage of them, long for a deeper relationship with God. Why don't we ask for that? Let's pray that God will lead us into a deeper relationship. Pray that... God will stir up the curiosity of explorers. God will make us aware of opportunities for conversations. I actually believe these opportunities exist all around us. If we just had sort of ears to hear the natural connections for the gospel, and fourthly, that God would actually give us a passion to share the faith we have. I think often, you know, if we are so shy to even talk about how important our faith is to us with each other, how are we going to talk about it with other people? So I say to churches, carve out some time in which you ha have people share about why they believe. Uh, have them even share about a mystical moment. Um, sometimes when I do workshops for, for churches and for dioceses, I, I throw out a little discussion question. Have you ever had a mystical moment? Now, it sounds like a bit of a sort of a, a crazy thing to ask Anglicans, but you talked at the number of Anglicans who have had a dream or a weird coincidence that strikes them in a, a different way. They read something, they hear a song, they even say, I mean, I've even had people who have begun a faith journey as a result of a stained glass window. Um, I had a couple come to church for the first time because they saw the royal wedding. This was Will and Kate's wedding and were curious about church. I mean, God can use anything. So do we have a passion to share the gospel that we know? Uh, these are great questions for us to ask, and they're great things for, for us to be praying about. 
But even as foundational as, you know, prayer is for getting a church off in a new direction, what other practices can we do? What else can we do to help people come into a life of faith in Christ? Uh, there's some really interesting data out of uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. You know, they work mostly with university students, and they've looked at what are the factors um, involved in someone moving from being a skeptic to being a committed Christian. And what they found was that there are sort of five general thresholds. And it's not like these are super distinct things. People, of course, move back and forth and sometimes leap over one and then come back to another. But the data from InterVarsity says that there are, in general, five thresholds in faith development that people often move through as they move from being an actual skeptic to a committed follower of Christ. The first is they move from distrust to trust. And I'm going to talk about each one of these in a minute. Sometimes we expect people to move all the way from being a skeptic to suddenly wanting to come to church, signing up for you know, PAR or envelopes or however you do that, get, get them on the rota to read. Um, this is deeply unrealistic. People generally have to first establish trust. If they are skeptical of the church and the church, let's face it, has given many people a reason to be skeptical. First, we have to build trust. Second, once that person has developed some level of trust, perhaps it's by meeting a Christian at work. Uh, perhaps it's being invited to, I don't know, a Christmas pageant or, uh, you know, a community choir. I don't know what it'll be. But they, once they've developed some level of trust, they may start to be curious about what that one friend at work actually believes. A third step is moving from simply being curious to actually being open to change in some way. A fourth step is where they move from, you know, being open to the idea to actually seeking, raising their questions, uh, wanting more information. And then the last step is from seeking to actually following. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, what I wanna ask you is, what does your church do to help people cross each one of these thresholds? Because we now are in a situation where about 79% well, of the Canadian population have no connection to a church. I remember doing a funeral for a much loved organist at our church. She was a young woman. She died of a very aggressive cancer. She had a slate load of piano students that came to this funeral. There were people that she sang in the community choir with. In other words, this funeral was packed with unchurched people. At the end of it, uh, a young mother came up uh, to me and she had her, her 12, maybe 11, 12 year old son with her. And she thanked me for the service and she talked to me about how important Marianne was in their life. And then she said this sentence to me, and this is my son. This is the first time he's ever been in a church. See, this is where we're at today. For us, it's very normal, right? For most of us, maybe many of us, we were raised in the church. But for an increasing number of the Canadian population, they don't know what happens in a church. And they've never been in one. Um, it may be hard for us to believe, 
but it is the reality. So let's talk about some of the ways quickly that we might be able to help people um, meet them where they're at, so to speak. Let's look at this first threshold. How might we help people move from distrust to trust? So remember here, all we're hoping for is that people will move to that place where they say, hmm, Christians are okay. One of the ways we can do this is by sharing fun. I don't know, is it a, you know, some kind of festive holiday that you rent the bouncy castle and then, you know, have food available, a barbecue maybe, um, and invite the neighborhood? Um, maybe it's a family day. Uh, maybe it's a special holiday of some sort that's celebrated in the community. Sharing fun can actually be a really powerful way to build trust. I think another important way is to share service. So does your church do a Christmas Day dinner for people that will be alone on Christmas? Um, I led a church in which this had gone on for 30 years. Um, we never had enough volunteer spots for all the people that would call and ask to volunteer. Uh, what we decided to do was to shift more of our church people out of the volunteer roles and get more people in uh, from the community into those roles and have our church people sit and talk with the people, form relationships, um, be hospitable, if you like, at this Christmas day dinner. What other kind of service do we do as Anglicans? Well, we have, you know, we help out at food banks, we have after school reading programs, uh, homework clubs, uh, we do park cleanups. Um, I don't know what your church does, but why not take that thing that you do and invite the neighborhood to join in. These are actually really great ways to form relationship with people. A third way is to share the needs or the concerns that function in your particular context. I don't know what they are. Are you a little rural church? Uh, probably you're not the only ones worried about depopulation in rural areas and the move to urban centers. Um, you know, there are lots of other things happening in rural areas um, that we actually can be quite helpful in as churches. We need to find out what are the needs and concerns. And what I say to churches, you know, why don't you just go out and talk to people in your neighborhood, do a little survey, send people to the businesses, um, Talk to people in dog parks, ask them, hey, would you mind? Our church is doing a survey on what is important in the, this neighborhood. Just get out there and ask people, what are the needs and concerns? In other words, to build trust, we need to actually spend time together with people who are privately faithful or spiritually uncertain. And that means we need to not be phased by distrust. So sometimes, um, you know, when I get talking to people, one of the first things they'll say is, oh, yeah, I left church years ago and I'm never going back. Well, that can be something that shuts down a conversation. Or you can say, huh, well, that sounds like it involves some pain. Do you mind telling me what happened? Or what about this? Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people like you. You know, they were in Sunday school as kids, but they haven't been back. But even if you're not involved in church now, well, what do you think about God? How about just starting a conversation with people? Not being phased by their distrust of the institution, particularly. Um, and finally, how about practicing some trust building? That means we 
pray for people when we do get to know them. We attend to them. We listen to what they have to say. We learn. We spend time with them. Um, one of my favorite things that I've heard of recently, and of course in the pandemic, a lot of this has been shut down. I love it when Christians hold a wine and cheese Christmas party at their house for neighbors on the street. It's surprising how many people feel isolated, particularly in suburbia. If you're in suburbia, you know, everybody's just leaving in the morning and coming home at night, exhausted from their commute. Um, they know life isn't right exactly. In our urban centers, there are other challenges. What can we do to connect with people? Um, you know, some of these things are no brainers. We already do them. Um, how about a clothing exchange for the neighborhood? Or if you're in a neighborhood where a lot of people ski, maybe, what about a ski equipment exchange? We need to start with this place of trust. Um, one year we moved our Sunday school picnic from sort of a, an isolated picnic area to one of the main picnic areas down by the lake at Lake Ontario in Oshawa. And we still put up our, we put up a big, in fact, I think we made a big banner for that year with the name of the church and on it. And we even put, you know, church picnic, come join us. And the games, all the silly games that people play at church picnics, I mean, you know, the egg toss, uh, the three-legged raise, the potato sack, you name it. We just invited the other people in the park to join us. Now, it, as it happens in Oshawa, Ontario, there's a lot of new immigrants who love to spend Sunday afternoon at the park. They have, you know, their family members around them. They have, you know, they're barbecuing. Um, we found that a lot of people just love to join in these games with their kids. It was a great way to actually build some trust. All right, so if we think about what can we do to build trust in our particular geographic location, our neighborhood? How about the next level up? We wanna move people from just trusting us to curious. Don't you kind of love this picture? I love it. But look what she's looking over. You know, sometimes the church can seem like an impenetrable wall for people. Um, thanks be to God, some people still climb the ladder to see what we're about. We want people here to move to that place where they say, Jesus is hmm, kind of interesting. I think we need to be curious ourselves. And that means we need to find out what kind of questions people have. How about going out and talking to people at the dog park and the park and the neighborhood and the ice cream shop and just saying, hey, our church is asking what kind of spiritual questions people have. Uh, let's find out and be curious. And then let's address their questions, not the questions we think they should have. Ask good questions yourselves. And I would say, you know, as Anglicans, we often are much more comfortable talking about the church than we are talking about Jesus. But time and time again, I've found people are actually really interested in this person, Jesus Christ. Focus on Christ. Focus particularly on how his teachings connect to life today. So there's one kind of cool video series that I quite like. It's produced out of Olive Tree Media in, in Australia and it's called Jesus the Game Changer. I don't know if any of you have seen it, uh, but you can Google it, um, you know, you can download the whole thing. Um, and it's 
really excellently produced. What this video series looks at is how the teachings of Jesus have affected the foundations of Western democracy. Uh, things like uh, the equality of women. Now the church doesn't have a, a perfect record on this, does it? <laughs> but at some level, when you look at actually what Jesus did, particularly his interactions with women, um, you know, you might talk about his interactions with Mary and Martha. It was quite strange, actually, that Jesus welcomed women into the community of learners. There are all kinds of other things. If you look at what Jesus had to say about money, uh, what he had to say about leadership, about power, about business. Um, so anyway, this little series, I would say it's maybe something that you can use as a practical tool to engage people's questions. What about the next step? Where now they're moving from uh, not just curious, but actually open to maybe something a bit deeper. Here we want people to be saying, Jesus isn't just interesting, but Jesus could be for me. Here, we're moving to a more personal reflection and discussion of faith. This might even be, might even take the form of something like a um, class in Christian meditation. You know, maybe you offer Christian meditation for the unchurched, you know, or Christian meditation for the newbie. Um, we know from the Angus Reid data that actually many people in our world are quite interested in the practice of meditation. After all, they're hearing that even some business leaders practice it as a, as a mental health uh, technique. So what can your church do that will lead people into deeper reflection and discussion? We want them to think about how Jesus' teaching might connect not just to esoteric questions, but to their lives. So here is where things like grief care, divorce care, uh, and even a, a wonderful program called the 12 Steps, A Spiritual Journey, uh, which indeed does use the same 12 steps that AA uses and, and NA use, but it's not focused specifically on any one form of addiction. Rather, the 12 Steps of Spiritual Journey, it's a journaling program that uh, I actually think probably 90% of the people in our churches could really benefit from this program uh, because it looks at, well, what are the 12 steps? They're basically the Christian disciplines put in language that everybody can understand. So I would just challenge you, you don't actually need to come up with brand new tools, although you may want to for your particular context. And of course, some of these tools are more readily available in English than in French. Um, but you know, you've got the tools to do translation. Explore what can help people move from curious to open to change. What about the next step? People moving from just open to change to seeking. And here is where people have moved to a place where they might be willing to say, hmm, Jesus is worth taking seriously. I think here you may look at things like the Alpha Course. Um, but if you you know, aren't in sync with the Alpha's particular theology, which, by the way, I think is great. I've used it numerous years, but it's not the only tool out there. There's also a great video series called Christianity Discovered. There is another series called Emmaus, which is a, a basically a, a whole discipleship program. There's also a great little film series out of Scripture Union Ireland. 
And it's basically a series of films that are little 15 minute clips that focus on one question that many people today have in our world. I would just say, explore these resources. You know, it'll take you half an hour to explore the NUA film series. Um, they're really well quality, very well uh, filmed series. And, you know, they're also all done in a lovely Irish accent. How do you get better than that? But here's the thing. There's lots of other ways to do this. What about book clubs? You know, there's a lot of people today interested in Zoom book clubs. What about exploring some of the great books that are out there? I don't know if there's any Marilyn Robinson fans out there, but her book, Gilead, um, it is full of great topics of mercy, redemption, forgiveness, all of those things that the Angus Reid poll identified as key to people today. There's also more standard apologetic material like Case for Christ. I'm still meeting people that like that book. There's The Language of God by Francis Collins, who, you know, headed up the Human Genome Project, now head of the um, National Institute of Health in the United States. A big brain uh, guy. Uh, he, in the language of God, talks about his own journey of faith. There's other books like Not God's Type um, by someone who was a skeptic, who now is a committed Roman Catholic and teaches apologetics uh, as her job, a former English major of all things. And then there's other books. I, I really still like the book Unapologetic. So any of these resources are things that can get people actually going deeper with what is the Christian faith about. And then at some point, you're going to want to help people move from simply seeking to making a step of commitment. And here's where people say, I want to be a Christian. Well, as an Anglicans, we have a lot of tools at our disposal for this one. I love to actually use the Anglican baptismal service. In it, we are going to do lots of things. We're going to have an opportunity to teach people about Jesus as Lord and Savior. We get to teach them about the creed, the Lord's Prayer. These are all basic catechetical tools, right? In baptism prep, for instance, we're going to be talking to them about those questions of renunciation and affirmation. Um, you might actually do a preaching series on those questions. I've often thought that would be great to do. We have at our disposal the sacraments, baptism, and we have confirmation and reaffirmation of faith. I often say to churches, plan a year ahead for an adult service of adult baptism, confirmation, and reaffirmation. Plan a year ahead. Put it in your calendar. When we take a step like that, I think for one thing, it tells our congregation that we are expecting that new disciples will be made in our midst that people will also be moving in these significant steps across these thresholds. Um, sometimes I would just put in the bulletin, you know, in two months from now, we're having a service of adult baptism, confirmation, and reaffirmation. Has anybody here taken an important step closer towards God? I was often surprised by the people that came forward. So why don't we use such moments? Because what we can do in such moments is have those people share why they're taking the step of reaffirmation or confirmation or baptism as an adult. And you know what? Often those services are full of friends and family members 
neighbors sometimes who come because they've been invited to be present. So those services actually have an opportunity to bear witness built right into them. Okay, I'm a little bit conscious of our time. Um, if you want to read any more about any of what I just talked about, those five thresholds of faith, um, you know, I can, I can give you references of a couple of books that I really have enjoyed about that. Um, one of them is called Breaking the Huddle, um, which I now include in the leadership course at, at Wycliffe. Uh, in the evangelism course. Um, Breaking the Huddle, uh, the authors are Everts, Schaup, and Jordan. I better double check on that. Okay, I'm gonna look that up and just make sure I've got that last author. But if you Google uh, Breaking the Huddle, uh, it's an IVP book, uh, you're gonna find it. I'm sure somebody's going to put it in the chat. We've been getting fed all the other references you're making. So awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So <laughs> it's fine to give you all this data, but the deep cultural change that we need in the church today is for churches to be thinking about what is the implication of this for ministry. How is this going to change your church budget? There's a great question to ask. Um, you know, one of the little uh, exercises I have students at Wycliffe do is I have them bring in a church budget. And I ask them, prove to me that mission is important to this church by highlighting lines in your church budget. It's a great little exercise for all of us to be doing. Okay, so I want to, uh, just before I kind of wrap up, I want to suggest an experiment for churches to try. Something called the Bible Study Project. So the data from Angus Reid and InterVarsity is, is only part of the reason I am sure that people are less disinterested than we think they are. Another reason is the reaction of unchurched and dechurched people to a project that I give students to do in my intro course on evangelism. And here's the project. They need to invite someone they know who has no church connection to read and discuss together three stories from the earliest biographies of Jesus's life. They can meet weekly. So they gotta meet for three weeks. They can meet over Zoom, FaceTime. I've had people do it on the phone um, or in person to read and discuss one of these gospel stories. And here's what I want them to do. To think about what phrases or words stand out for them. What do you think this passage tells us about the culture of the day in which they were written? What do you think the passage wants us to know about Jesus today? And do you see any connection with our lives today? So it's a pretty simple little exercise, right? You would not believe how terrified the students are of doing this. Um, they're, they're worried that well, frankly, people will say no when they ask them. Now, I've been teaching this course for eight years, and there's usually 20 to 25 students in this class every year. So what's that? You know, close to 200 students. I've only had one student who the first person they asked said no. Now, this is kind of astonishing to me. I, I thought the rejection rate, personally, I thought it'd be way higher. But you see, when people were asking, who were they asking? Well, in some cases, they were asking a housemate. In some cases, a cousin. 
a best friend, someone they'd recently connected from their childhood on Facebook. Um, I had somebody do it with a colleague at work that they're used to going for lunch with. Only out of, out of 200 students, one student, the person said no. What was more typical in fact, was that after that first meeting, the person they were meeting with often invited somebody else into the conversation. I had one student who ended up having four guys want to join the conversation. Um, I had one student who asked his neighbor, and because his neighbor's wife had to go out for something, he had to bring his kids with him to the conversation. I said, oh, how did that go? He said, well, we just did it at my kitchen table. And, you know, I just put some books out for the kids to read. And I said, oh, what kind of books did you put out? He <laughs> said, oh, I put some Bible story books out. The conversation that actually grew out of that meeting was not based on the gospel passage. It was based on one of the Bible story books. So if my students can do this, what would happen if every church tried this little project? What would happen if in our churches, everybody in our pews discipled just one person over the course of the next year or maybe two? Had fun with them, shared service with them, help them explore their questions, found out what their questions were, walked through the original biographies of Jesus, talked about how those things have impacted their life. I actually see no reason why churches themselves can't try this out. So we come back to this. Because the problem lies in people, the solution lies in them too. The work of addressing an adaptive challenge must be done by the people connected to the problem. And that means all of us, all of us. I had a, a really weird thing happen. Uh, Last summer, no, the summer before, because 2020 kind of disappeared. Um, in 2019, I was asked to preach at this little uh, church up in Muskoka. And it's one of these uh, historic boat-in churches. Um, and, you know, people from all over Muskoka boat in to come to this church. But this conversation was happening at dinner the night before. So the people that were putting me up at this cottage, they'd invited their friends from the next cottage over to come to dinner, a barbecue. And it turned out that the couple coming, she was a really confirmed agnostic or maybe even closer to atheist. And her husband was a lapsed Catholic. But, you know, eventually the conversation got around to what I was doing there. <laughs> and so they asked me, um, you know, what are you going to talk to about tomorrow? And I said, well, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about a passage from the Bible. Um, but, you know, really what I, what I want to do is help people connect that passage to their own lives. Well, the next thing she, the woman said to me was, um, well, why do you think God is even real. And I said, oh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the few perks of the ministry uh, because there's lots of downsides, but one of the few perks is you get to see the way God actually does stuff in people's lives. And she said, like what? I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better lead in because then I got to spend half an hour telling her stories of things that I had seen God do in people's lives. And at the end of it, you know, she was kind of quiet. 
and her husband was kind of quiet. And he said, you know, it's weird, but this is one of the first time in decades that I've really had a conversation about faith with anybody. Privately faithful is my guess. But what about her? She said, you know, I don't buy it. It sounds like you believe God actually loves every person in a really personal way. And I said, yeah, I, I kind of do, because that's what I've seen. She said, that's impossible. Look at the billions of people in the world. How could God possibly love every single person? So, you know, by this time, dinner was over and the, the table was cleared away. And it was one of those big Muskoka cottage tables, you know, like they're 10 feet long. And everything was off the table. But there was a little uh, crust, a little speck of bread crust uh, that was left over. And it was sort of sitting in the middle of the table. And it might have just been, you know, the size of a, a pea. And I don't know what, I don't know what came to me, but I think it was a God thing. Um, I said to her, well, look, you see this big table in front of us. I said, if this little piece of bread is our whole galaxy, not just our world, but our solar system and all of the stars, if this little piece of bread is our galaxy, and if God is the one who made the whole table, isn't he big enough to love all the people on our little world? And all she said was, wow. See, she'd never really been given that kind of picture of God. Now, you know, the conversation ended shortly after and it was a long night and I had to get up early and the people that were driving, you know, taking me by boat to this church, they were getting up early too. I just had such a powerful sense that God had done something in those people's lives. And I did not feel pressed to say, well, by the way, would you like to pray the sinner's prayer with me tonight? Now, there might be a situation in which I might do that. I wouldn't rule that out, but it wasn't that night. I think we need to be people of prayer who lift up everything that we are to God and offer it to God. So I want to leave you with this. It's my, one of my favorite little passages from Ezekiel. You know, we as a people have been in a place of dry bones before, um, right? I love that, you know, Ezekiel says, son of man, can these bones live? I love that Ezekiel's brave enough to ask that question. I hope you ask it of your church. I hope you ask God, can these bones live? I said, Oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. So Ezekiel's, you know, the angel says to him, can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, oh, it doesn't look very hopeful to me. You, you're the only one that can answer that question. Then he said to me, and I love the power of this command, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. It's a great passage. And, you know, we need to preach this passage for the church today. Because God wants to meet these people, the privately faithful, the spiritually uncertain you know, he really does. And I think I want to say to you, don't forget about Isaiah 41. Do not fear, for I am with you. 
Do not be afraid, for I am your God. In those moments where you need strengthening, I'm going to strengthen you. When that doesn't quite do it, you actually need help. Guess what? I'm going to help you. And those days where you don't even have the strength to carry on, I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. So, you know, we have these resources in these beautiful passages of scripture, and, and we don't need to uh, give up on our calling as Christians. What we need to do is embrace our calling as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, that last bit is really key. So it's 4 p.m. and um, I've thrown a lot at you. I hope that uh, you'll take you know, the, the gems away and uh, leave the rest. And All right, so let's get going. Nice to see you again, Judy. Good to be here. So we're hoping we have until 10.50 for our conversation, and uh, we would love for this to be a conversation that includes uh, the delegates to Senate as well. I've got the chat function open here, and so if you have any comments or questions, ideas, or anything you want to say, put it in the chat function. I can't promise uh, that we will do justice to everything you say, but we will be watching it, and um, we would love it if this would be interactive. So feel free to weigh in. Judy, you gave us such a lot to think about yesterday and ponder over. And I, I want to sort of launch in kind of through the word change. There's a couple of words that are going around with what you had to talk to us about. Was One was evangelism and the other was change. Now they're both quite linked. And you gave us a lot of statistics, which were really important yesterday, which I think were you know, people found encouraging. The response to your statistics was on the whole positive. People talked about opportunity, being hopeful, room to grow. Um, and um, But I think that it really calls us towards everything happening in the religious landscape in Canada and in Quebec to a change of mindset, even before we think of um, practices. And you kind of you went there and talked a bit about how we really can't see ourselves as dividing up the Anglican pie any longer. We can't assume that people will move into our neighborhoods and enough Anglicans will be there uh, for us to continue the way we were. And I think that points us towards a really important shift to how we understand how we grow, how we reach out. What if yeah. Could further? yeah, I mean, um, I think when, when Christendom, if you like, was in full operation, um, you know, most people thought of Canada as a Christian country um, with, you know, certainly some other faith groups present, but by and large, they thought of it as a deeply Christian country. And so, I mean, in this, when I was growing up in Ottawa in the 60s, for instance, um, all of my friends that I played with on the street I knew what church they all went to, whether it was United or Roman Catholic or Anglican or Lutheran, those were the primary uh, mainstay groupings. And then, you know, we knew there were also Baptists and Pentecostals, but the thing was, I knew that all my friends, their families had a church. That was the norm then. Um, so when, you know, we thought about building a new suburb and buying property and building a church. Our natural go-to was, I wonder how many Anglicans uh, reside in this area. Well, all of that has gone in a, in a relatively short period of time, really. Because now we're in a situation where 80%, close to 80% of the population have no church connection. They, they have no, you know, um, they're not lying in bed on a Sunday morning thinking, I wonder where the Anglican church is. And they're not thinking even, I wonder where I could hear a really good sermon this morning or where the music's good. They're, they're not thinking about these things. They, they have no real connection to the church. Um, 
So that is a remarkable change that has happened just within my lifetime. Um, and I think that when your environment changes that quickly, you know, it's entirely natural for us to be trying to look back and see what we can do according to the old structures and the old ways and how can we fix this thing? We're looking for technical fixes uh, is the language that um, Ron Heifetz would use in the practice of adaptive leadership. Uh, technical fixes, if you think about uh, the difference between a technical challenge and an adaptive challenge, if you think of your car um, needing a brake job, um, you know, you, you start to hear that familiar sound of squeaking when you put on the brakes and you start to get a little bit worried. Um, and so the, the technical challenge here is the brakes on your car don't work. Uh, and the technical fix is, of course, what most of us do. We take the car in to get a brake job done, you know? Um, that's an easy thing. It involves us doing one thing, uh, an expert involved that is the mechanic, or if you're blessed enough to have somebody in your house that knows how to do that, uh, it's still an expert thing. But what if the problem is you just had triplets that just got their driver's license and none of them are really driving properly. They're, they're speeding up and slowing down. Uh, so that's a bit different. That is an adaptive challenge. That means the driving behavior of the family has to change. That's going to be a lot harder to change than taking it to the mechanic to get it fixed. You, I mean, you can do that. For a certain amount of time, you can do that. Uh, but is it actually getting at the real adaptive problem? So that's an example that Heifetz uses in his book, Practice of Adaptive Leadership. So if we think about the adaptive challenges that the church is facing with this big shift from Christendom uh, to something else, um, we're, we're facing huge adaptive challenges. For instance, the role of clergy. Uh, clergy were the professionals. We provided what we called services, worship services. The language is informative, no? Um, we provided rites of passage, it was called. Uh, the sacraments, for sure, all of these things are, are good. But, you know, the... The difficulty is, in this new environment, what we need to do is, as leaders in the church, we need to cultivate, I would say, some ancient ways again. Um, we're in a new environment, and we need to mobilize the whole church to engage in the apostolic, I would call it, calling of the church. And, you know, some of the other adaptive challenges I talked about yesterday, uh, biblical illiteracy, you know, uh, how do we get our people, our own people, really grounded in the Christian story? Um, how do we move out of what Christendom cultivated, which was a privatized faith, into what we need today, which is uh, people that are, are willing to not just live out their faith through deeds, but also to share with people about it. Because we're actually in an environment now where it's okay to talk about spirituality again. So, you know, some of these adaptive challenges are going to be much tougher than just finding one technical fix um, to address. Yeah, so that's what I would have to say about that key difference between the adaptive challenges that we are facing in this new environment that we're in and, um, you know. I like that the adaptive. Old, the old terrain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's really key for us to take away that phrase adaptive challenges, you say, it's not just a technical fix. And, and you said, I like that, the shift from Christendom to something else. Do we know what that something else is? Do we kind of understand the environment we're in? 
I mean, Chris Sparger made a comment. He goes, back in the 60s, newspapers would even print the sermons from prominent local churches. It's amazing. It's oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. even sooner than there are still local papers that have a regular column by clergy. So this is the thing. The shift from Christendom didn't happen overnight. It's, it's still happening. And there are parts of society that are, are more deeply still rooted in Christendom. Um, certainly, if you go to the Southern Bible Belt, it's entirely normal to ask a new colleague that starts at your place of work, where do you go to church? Uh, I mean, I had a friend from Montreal that moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. She said she was astonished by this because that is not a question that would be deemed culturally acceptable back in Montreal. Um, so I, I think we have to recognize that, you know, these big cultural shifts that our culture makes, they are, um, they happen gradually and they also happen as a result of people coming to the realization, for instance, that Christendom wasn't so perfect. When you have people coming to church out of cultural obligation, that's not something I see anywhere in the Gospels. And then we also know that Christendom brought a lot of havoc with it. It was married to colonialization. Um, you know, it, it meant that, um, I mean, I, I grew up in the church of the 60s. And I can tell you, it wasn't such a great place. Um, our numbers were better, but does that get to define success in the church? I hope not. Uh, it's one definition. Uh, so, you know, I think there's, uh, we shouldn't be trying to get back to Egypt, you know, as, as the people in the wilderness were. The wilderness was an uncomfortable place for the, for the Israelites. Uh, they had to rely on God. They had to follow God around. They had to watch for God, what God was doing um, in the smoke and in the fire. Um, they had to live in a place of discomfort. Uh, and, and what did they do there? You know, many of them said, oh, you know, back in Egypt, we had melons to eat. We had all this good stuff. I mean, they were in slavery back there. We, we should not be trying to get back to Christendom. What we need to be thinking about is how is God actually at work in the midst of this transition? Um, because, you know, even during the, the exile in the Old Testament, which was a cataclysmic change for the Hebrew people, um, you know, the, the Babylonian exile was catastrophic in many ways. And yet, what happened during the exile? Their worship was reformed in astonishing ways. Um, the, the scriptures were recorded, were pulled together and brought together in, you know, a semblance of, you know, the Old Testament, what we would call the Old Testament canon. Um, there were some amazing things that happened. So um, by no means here that I want to go back to Christendom. Uh, but we do need to adapt to this new environment that we are in. And I think we have to recognize that as human beings, that's not our greatest strength all the time. In fact, there's lots of things that we will do to avoid that kind of adaptive work. Yeah. Well, that's really, I think, a key thing you were talking about. Just before we get there, um, a couple of people have said, uh, Deborah talked about, you know, as you were saying, you know, there was a lot that was damaging about Christendom. Uh, yeah. And so at some levels, we're in a very refreshing place. You know, a, it's a really great place. But as you say, it's something we need to adapt to. Um, yeah. But sometimes it's something we prefer to avoid, the work that it calls us to. And you mentioned that briefly yesterday. I wonder if you could expand on that. Yeah. So again, you know, there's so much we could sort of delve into about this, but I'll give you some examples of, um, again, this is out of the practice of adaptive leadership. I'll give you some example of, of work avoidance tactics as they're talked about in that text. 
And then I'll tell you what they look like in the church. <laughs> uh, so for instance, one work avoidance tactic is to rely on a technical fix that in the past has worked. Um, in church land, this means uh, you take a look at your budget and um, you know you cut expenses. Um, and this isn't just Anglicans. You know, I was talking to a Baptist pastor a number of, uh, well, I guess, gee, it's more like four or five years ago now. And um, the, the technical fix that her church decided was to ask her to take a three-week unpaid leave. So I thought that was a pretty bit of fancy footwork, actually, on the behalf of a church that was not actually dealing with their physical problems. They were going to dump those problems on a quick fix that is oh, if we just don't have to pay the pastor for three weeks or a month or whatever it was. Um, so that's one, that's one sort of work avoidance tactic. Focus on a technical fix that has worked in the past. Uh, another is to use sort of current expertise. So say churches are used to running a rummage sale, a Christmas bazaar, uh, those kind of old staples of, I don't know what it's like in Diocese of Montreal, but in the Diocese of Toronto, there were a lot of churches that would use this to kind of, um, you know, usually it was the women of the church, the Anglican church women who would hold these things and then they would donate to the budget of the church. They would top it up if you like. Um, rummage sales, bake sales and Christmas bazaars, they can be really good things. I would not want to ax those things. Um, in some cases, they can be actually missional uh, vehicles. But if we are relying on those to bail us out of an adaptive challenge that requires all of us to make the changes that we need to make, uh, you know, we're in trouble because that current expertise is not going to help us. Um, of course, there's another work avoidance tactic, and that is to deny the problem. Um, so these may be the people that say, oh, you know, we've been here before. We've had our fiscal challenges before. Um, and, you know, when we come out of the pandemic, everybody's coming back to church. And maybe even some of those people that were online will join us. And, uh, you know, this is, this is not a real problem that we have to address. Let's just wait and see. Um, here's another work avoidance tactic. It's called the proxy fight slash conflict. Um, in church land, it translates often into, we just need a better preacher. Or uh, we need someone who visits everybody like so-and-so did 50 years ago. Um, in other words, that's putting the, the solution to the problem on someone particular, instead of understanding that this is something that's going to require a cultural change in the church. Um, here's another work avoidance tactic, shoot the messenger. Um, occasionally, you know, I don't, I don't know what your vestry meetings have been like, but very occasionally, someone will stand up and say, you know, I've been around this church a long time. How dare you tell us we need to change? Um, targeting a person in authority, which, by the way, uh, can also look different, not, not just within the parish, but sometimes people attack the authority of wardens, of treasurers, of bishops. Um, scapegoating a particular person is another work avoidance tactic. So we just need to drop the youth pastor. We can't afford the youth pastor, the church secretary, uh, you know, the pastoral team. We can't afford that anymore. Whatever it is um, that is going to allow you to say, we just do this. We just got rid of this person and uh, their expense and we'll be okay. And then there is 
externalize the enemy. And to externalize the enemy real, usually means we're going to attack the bishop, the diocese, maybe even the national church, um, you know, the primate even. I mean, if we can lay this problem on somebody else, uh, then that also lets us off the hook. So these are all, you know, they're all things that we recognize, work avoidance tactics that we recognize. And, you know, they're, they're kind of funny. Uh, they're human nature, for sure. But I think until we actually take a look and, you know, actually talk about them, why is it that Anglicans have such a negative view of evangelism? And by not way, not just Anglicans, we saw from the Angus Reid poll that if everybody hates the word evangelism. Um, interestingly, a lot of people don't like the word theology. Why might that be? I'd like to know myself whether, you know, people have an equally negative um, response to the term local theology. Um, that, that would be interesting to me to find out. But what is it about theology that is such a turnoff to people? What is it about that word? Um, so, you know, I would just say that there's there are also sort of default stories that we um, adapt and live into as people who don't want to do the hard work of disciples making disciples because that is where we need to go in our day one default story Heifetz calls where's Waldo in the church uh, it translates as well I'm just not an evangelist see if you can just say well I don't have the gift of evangelism then you know you can just be completely let off the hook right? Completely that off the hook. Another, um, you know, default story that we live into is one hype. It's called end world hunger. Uh, in other words, the problem is just too big for your little church to grapple with. Um, the problem we often tell ourselves is, well, we just, it's secularism. You know, society's just changed too much. People aren't interested in religion. Um, we just need to hunker down, circle the wagons. Now, while it's true that secularism has been a growing reality in our world, um, at least in the public sphere, which is interesting to me. So there's some tension between the rise of secularism, particularly as a response to pluralism in a pluralistic culture, because we're not the only faith group in Canada today. Um, so in the public sphere, you see a rising secularism. But when you look at things like people's personal beliefs, personal behaviors, and personal attitudes, which is what the Angus Reid poll looked at, you see a different picture. Um, even if on the, in the public sphere, there is a uh, story told, I would say it is, about how secular a society we are. And I think, you know, particularly in Quebec with uh, the rules around the display of religious symbols, that was such a, an interesting and I think deeply telling um, argument. Um, in the public sphere, we are saying, you know, displays of any religious affiliation may not be shown. Um, but, but as human beings, we, we're not simply public or private. We are holistic human beings. So 
is it's ridiculous to think that a Christian is not influenced by their faith in the public sphere. And that you can simply do away with a person's uh, religious frameworks by banning a religious symbol in the same, and the same of course goes for, for Hindu and Sikh and Buddhist and Muslim people. Um, so, you know, I would just counter this default story of uh, we're just too secular now. Um, we're just too secular. Your church can be a church of disciples making disciples. I am 100% convinced of that. The data shows it. My own experience teaching students shows it. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something really important for us to, to grasp. Not so much in Anglican circles, but in other denominations, there's another default story that I think uh, we often lean into as Christians. And that is one that Heifetz calls Breakfast of Champions. Uh, this is a default story that says, look, God has got this. Uh, this is the sovereignty of God uh, story. That now, now hear me, please. I do believe God is sovereign, but does that allow us to not be disciples making disciples? Because you know, whoever God is predetermined, some denominations will say, um, is is in the kingdom, and those that aren't in the kingdom. Um, so there's a, there's actually a lot of default stories that Christians of all denominations can live into to avoid grappling with this, you know, really difficult adaptive change that we're in. I like to say, I mean, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I have now for 25 years been talking to churches about evangelism. I usually start by unpacking their own fears of evangelism. And I have them write things like, you know, what's your worst fear? What's your worst experience? Uh, what, what are you missing in order to be an evangelist? So when, when I've done that, I've ended up talking a lot about people's hesitancy around evangelism. I now wonder if that was the right approach. I mean, it's true, people are fearful and they have weird images of what evangelism is. And they often think you have to be sort of a Billy Graham character to be an evangelist. Um, but the, the reality is, it's when people actually start talking to someone else about their faith. Um, and particularly things like focusing on who Jesus is taking a look at three passages from the Gospels, inviting a grandchild to talk about that with them, or a neighbor, or a colleague, or a friend, or another family member. Um, it's actually when people start doing discipleship that we see the the real fruit of a disciple making a disciple. And, and we see a joy that bubbles up. I mean, my favorite class in the intro evangelism course at Wycliffe is the day that we get to talk about the Bible study projects. The students come in so energized to tell me about what happened in these conversations. And, you know, weird things happen. I mean, last year, I had a student, sorry, 2019, because of COVID, uh, 2019, I had a student who was preparing for uh, stuff on the subway. She had a long subway ride into the heart of Toronto. On the subway, she was looking through her stuff, planning out what passages she was going to choose to talk about with her friend. And a woman sitting kitty corner to her on the subway said, oh, that's interesting. What are you doing? And it ended up that they had this incredible conversation. They exchanged phone numbers. 
um, that actually ended up being a really fruitful little sort of side conversation. Um, I, we don't know how God is going to work. We just do, we plant seeds, you know, wherever we can, we plant seeds and we watch to see what God, what God does in, you know, helping those seeds, bringing them to, to a full harvest. So I would just say, I want to talk less about evangelism, but I want to challenge people to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. There's quite a lot of comment about that. I wanted to pick up on some people are saying is the word too, you know, sort of been, it's been so abused. Is it even usable any longer? And others are saying, well, there's a difference between evangelism and proselytizing. Oh, yes. And evangelism in this context, in this new space we find ourselves in. But there's a question, I think, earlier on, I love that thing about disciples making disciples. And someone asked earlier, Jean-Jacques put in a question about language around God and Jesus Christ. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about that in this new space in which we find ourselves. How yeah. do we talk about Jesus? I, I actually think, um, I think the best thing is we actually need to, to listen to first to where people are at. Um, sometimes I think, you know, in gardening, you, you have to actually clear the stones out before you can till the soil. And so you need to find out what are people's stones, you know, long before you're planting seeds, what are their stones? You know, questions like, well, what's your experience with the church? You know, what do you think about Christianity? Uh, who do you think Jesus is? It might be uncomfortable for us to listen to their answers. And I don't think you have to defend um, everything in that setting. I, I think what's really important is for us to actually listen first. Um, what language do, do people use? <laughs> you know, um, sometimes the church gets caught, caught up in our own issues and they're not issues that unchurched people actually have. Um, but I do think we need to first listen to what our, you know. So, so let's talk Jesus. Um, I, I was really struck by, uh, it was actually a, a very long article that was posted to social media by a guy named Paul Kingsnorth. I don't know if any of you have heard of this guy, but he was... He was actually, a, he was raised in an atheistic context. Uh, he became a social and environmental activist. He became quite disillusioned with sort of the, I guess, the politics of, of much of what he saw. He began to be worried that there weren't ethical frameworks guarding and guiding some of what he himself was involved in. He started on a spiritual quest that led him through, I think just about every faith group, major faith group that exists in the world. And fairly recently, he became um, a Christian in the Orthodox tradition. And his writing about that is really astonishing. I love to read stories, conversion stories, because they can tell us a lot about what people are actually seeking. And um, you, have a, you have a sense when you read Paul Kingsnorth's story that God was pursuing him in an astonishing way. I don't know how to explain that. Um, I don't try to demystify God. God forbid we do that. Um, but I do think that um, we have a very unhealthy image of evangelism. So I, I don't know if you're interested, but I, you know, I, I did prepare some slides uh, that I thought I might be able to get to yesterday on the images of evangelism people often have, the connotations the uh, experiences even they've had, you know, that, that 
the ringing of the doorbell at supper time and there's the two well-dressed Mormons at the door. Um, maybe you have an image of someone uh, passing you a, a tract on the street. Uh, maybe somebody even that's very coercive. Um, someone that has used a mechanistic approach to evangelism. Just say these words and you're in. Um, somebody that a lot of people feel objectified by Christians who have tried to share the faith. It's like they, uh, they feel like somebody's project. These, I think all of these approaches to evangelism are actually deeply linked to modernity. Uh, they're, they're linked to a mechanistic view of giving people the right information and then you know, presenting it as almost a sales pitch to them. Uh, there was also in the past fear brought in, right? Fear of hell, uh, fear of a judging God. Um, so th there have been plenty of, of really unhealthy approaches to evangelism. Um, it's why in the Course in Evangelism at Wycliffe, I actually teach about evangelism through the lens of conversion stories of scripture. One of my favorite is the story of the healing of Naaman. Um, who are the witnesses in the story? Um, nobody calls them evangelists. Um, I, I think they're witnesses. The slave girl um, who tells her mistress, if only my master could meet the prophet that is in my country, he would heal him of his leprosy. I, I picture this little girl who has been actually, why does she even want good for her master, her so-called master? Uh, she's been carted off from her land. And yet there she is in this foreign land and speaking a word of hope uh, to this uh, general in this foreign army. The servants in the story play a really interesting role. God acts through the servants. And then of course, God acts through the prophet. Um, I, I think it's such a, a fabulous story to teach about witness. Um, the word witness even has a negative connotation. I, I actually like the, the language of disciples making disciples. <laughs> disciples sharing what they've come to know about God. That's the language I like to use. Um, you know, I say if the word evangelism gets in the way of evangelism, why use it? I kind of hate that we have to ditch the word, um, but I think it's, you know, uh, you know, the other thing I want to say is God can use anything. So as much as I say passing out a tract on a street to somebody as complete stranger, I don't think that's the best way to make a disciple but I have to tell you I know people that came to faith that way so I, I would just say we have to be careful not to um, criticize the past we, we don't live in the past um, I think we have to look at our present culture and say what are the questions people are asking today? Um, you know, a deeply relational form of evangelism is actually the biblical form by and large. There are people that come to faith uh, other ways, but I mean, even when you look at the life of St. Paul and his extraordinary sort of mystical experience and how that is at the heart of his turning to Christ. Still, you see someone who uh, reaches out to mentor him in the faith, to disciple him in the faith. So I truly believe that disciples making disciples is actually where we need to go. And I think people, if they can't perceive themselves to be an evangelist, so what? Help them see that they can be a disciple making a disciple. 
Oh, thank you. That was beautiful. We're almost out of time. We have three minutes to go. But I love that idea of disciples making disciples. There was someone put it in the chat, disciples fostering disciples and helping yeah, encourage yeah. spiritual development. I love it because what you're talking about is relational. And it's also kind of in it for the long haul. We're not talking about, as you say, a more yeah. modernist approach. You know, these three steps, take this yeah. course. It's actually, I want to be in relationship with you. Yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, if you look at a course like Alpha, what is what are the components of Alpha? For sure, there's there's information about the basic faith, but there's also a meal shared. Um, there's a, yes. a, a service of prayer for healing. There's a weekend away. These are deeply relational things. Um, I think disciple making is best, um, but I, I also hear the question that says that word making. That word is a dangerous word. We don't actually make disciples, do we? We have to be really clear about that. The conversion of the human heart is a work of the Holy Spirit. What we do, the, the definition of evangelism I actually use is helping people, empowered by the Holy Spirit, first off, helping people take steps towards becoming an apprentice of Jesus. Uh, an apprentice, a uh, disciple has become a religious word, but an apprentice, that's an active word. It means you're learning things, you're learning new ways, you're learning new practices. And as, a, as disciples, I like the word cultivating disciples, actually. I love that, that imagery of cultivating, because I do think that if you think about the process of um, planting a garden, you clear the stones, you till the soil, you put down fertilizer first off. Uh, you know, eventually you get when the condition is right, you plant the seeds and then you water, you wait, you water, you wait, you weed. In other words, it is a process. Uh, most people, not everybody, but most people come to faith over a period of years. So I say, let's not wait any longer <laughs> to get started. That's the main thing. Let's get started now. Wow. Well, thank you, Judy. That is a really great thought to end on.